I do it right? And is there a mic on me? Let's see. You want to check it? Is that all right? There we go. It's like Jesus touched it and healed the mic. That's amazing. The first thing I'm going to do is lose my jacket. It's getting holy warm in here. <laughs> yeah, amen. So my name is Lee Callen. I've been here a good long while, almost 30 years. But, it's, but this is family. This is my family. And I love this family. And from when I went to Yukon and was get, being fed by the Connors and by the Spearies and just, you know, sustaining a, a, a poor college student. And uh, I've been here ever since. And I love, you know what I love about family? I love what Rondi just said. He had to go through her to get to his wife. Because why? <coughs> why? Because of protection. Because we protect each other. So as you can see, we're going to be talking about, this is a great time of year. And I'm not talking about March Madness. I'm not talking about, you know, baseball opening day. We're talking about gardens that are about to emerge. This is a favorite time of year. My wife and I had the privilege in 2001 to go to this place that you see in the, on the uh, screen. And this place is called Chateau de Villandry. And it's in Loire Valley. And it is spectacular. It is the most brilliant garden. You could spend so many days trying to explore every aspect of this garden. And we're going to talk about returning to the garden. Returning to the garden. That's the title today, brothers and sisters. Because, you know, in the Bible, we see a garden in the beginning. We see a garden experience midway. We see a garden at the end. And it's very significant. So that's what we're going to look at today. You can be turning with me to Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start there. Three things that I want to look at today. Being inside the garden, outside of the garden back to the garden. Inside, outside, back to the garden. Last week, we remember what Sajin had talked about? The problem of? Evil. Problem of evil, that's right. So we talked about that, and I want to see it in this context, because here's, here's why God, because God is love, choice is essential. Because God is love, because forced love is not true love. Right. Choice is essential. The beauty and value of love is such that it must be freely chosen. But as a consequence of this, it allowed for the emergence of evil. We will talk about that today, but we'll talk about the broader context. So inside the garden, before we read from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, I just want to back up uh, uh, to the story that we read in, in Genesis 1, where it says the first 10 words of the Bible, in the beginning, God created, you can finish it, the heavens and the earth. And we're going to talk about that today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But let's, let's think about how that progression went. Because it was darkness. It was over the deep. It was chaos. And God was setting order to disorder as the Spirit hovered over the deep. And He put time in place, night and day. He put a boundary for the waters, only this far and no farther. So the land was there. And He also set the seasons. And then He began to create living organisms. Plants first. What was next? Birds and fish. What was next? Then the animals. And then finally, man. Look at that progression. We've got to keep that in mind as we read this. Read with me in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 4. It says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord made the earth and the heavens, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put up the man he had formed. The Lord had made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip down to verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree 
of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, when you eat from it, you will surely die. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord had formed out of the ground all the wild animals, all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, now is, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. What we see here, church, is we see God preparing a place for us, for man, order, setting order, disorder, beauty, provision, a highly ordered system. He was preparing a place for us to dwell, for us to dwell with him. Because, you know, watching a sunset is great alone, but even better when you have someone with you to sit and marvel at the garden that God had made. We also see this, I love this, creative, uh, progressive complexity. Do we not? Because we, so we just said what was made first, the biosphere, the plants. Then the fish and the birds, a little more complex. Then the tetrapods, right? Those creatures roaming the earth, the animals, all the creatures. And then finally he made man, as we read in 2.7. He was of the dust of the earth and the divine breath, standing on the border between heaven and earth. Divine and of the earth. Amazing concept, as John Oakes talked to us about, the only creature that could choose apart from his designed purpose. Wow. Really trans transcendent in every way. But then, after the man was formed, creation was not complete. God couldn't be fully reflected in just man. We needed a woman to come on the scene special significance. Think about, I think this is going to help us to understand what makes women so unique. Brothers, it's going to give us insight into our sisters, okay? So hear me out here. Think about that creative progression. So what was the final pinnacle of creation? A woman. No wonder she's on every magazine cover. Think of it this way. If Adam was formed from the dust and she was formed from the rib, She's double refined dust. <laughs> double refined dust. And as the pinnacle of creation, all Adam could say was, whoa, man. Whoa, man. She was the 2.0, brothers. This explains a lot. She have a, she's got a built-in replicator. She's got an emotional analyzer. An intuition actuator. We don't have that. She has the ability to multitask without crashing the system, which always happens in the 1.0. It explains a lot, doesn't it? Besides all this, women exemplify beauty. They are drawn to beauty. They uniquely express this refinement. And this really helps explain why there are 42 pillows on my bed <laughs> that properly correspond to the curtains that change according to the various iterations of the seasons. OK, I need one pillow. And yet, Father, because of that woman right there, there she is. You can wave, sweetie. I have 42 pillows on my bed. I have to swim through a sea of pillows just to get to the one that has any function. Never mind telling me to arrange the pillows the way she arranged them. I'm a 1.0. I can't handle the complexity. It explains a lot. 
<laughs> Just say that next time. I'm a 1.0, sweetheart. I'm sorry I forgot the bread and the milk. <laughs> Multitasking crashes my system. It just crashes it. I want us to notice something else about the woman. I mean, about the way she was made. She was made from Adam's side. And some of you have probably heard Matthew Henry's comment on this. I'll read it to you. The woman was made of a rib out of Adam's side, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, near his heart to be beloved. That's God's design. Amen. That's God's design. We, inside the garden, amazing, but trouble was on the horizon. We looked at that last week in Genesis 3, the very next chapter. To summarize, we understand that they were given a single instruction. They were to rule over the beasts. They were to know that they were made in whose image? God's image. And they were told to not eat from that tree because there would be consequences. But they would be deceived to think less of God, less of their role, and less of themselves. They thought God was holding out on them. Have you felt that? I have. What, what is this, God? What is, why would you allow that? They had those thoughts. They wanted to reach for more, and they failed to trust God. And in selfish indulgence, they reached for more, and as, as a consequence, actually went down. And they already were reflecting God's image and yet they thought there was more. Failing to trust God and seeking a separate existence from him, separation was their choice. Now God, in his mercy, cast Adam and Eve from the garden. In his mercy. Why? Why is this important? Because the tree of life was still there. And if they took from the tree of life, they would have been sealed in a perpetual fallen state. And so God, in his mercy, said, I've got to reconcile this. Let me bar them from that existence, and I'm going to figure that out in the future. But we're going to have to cast them from the garden. And then the first sacrifice was made, and they were clothed with the skins of the animal that was sacrificed. Brothers and sisters, reading right through until chapter 11, we just see a spiral downward. It goes from distrust, betrayal, finger-pointing to murder, and it just keeps going down. But then from Genesis 12 on, we see God seeking a way to reconcile, figuring out a way for that return to happen so they could once again be with him in the garden. What was created? Heavens and earth. Hell was not a creation. It was a byproduct of their choice, this separation, this sin, this missing the mark, not doing things as God had determined. No, I think I know better. I feel like this is the right course instead of trusting God's words. Heaven and earth. Heavens. There was no image of the globe, the sphere. That wasn't until 70 years ago. Heaven. What's above? God's space. Earth. What's below? Our space. That was the, that was the vantage point. That was the perspective. The garden. The intersection of the two. So right now I want to give something, an image. So I'm going to call my son Nathan up. And we have Jarrett, and we have Keenan's going to come up and help me out here. Give these guys a hand. Okay, you're going to be down over there. Okay, guys, I was praying. Now, come on up here, Jarrett. Look at this. I was praying. I was like, God, I need someone six foot five. Look who he gave me. Okay, Jarrett, you're going to be over here. You're going to hold that up. All right, so here we go. So this is what I want to see. Yes, okay. So we're going to think of it this way. And you're going to be right here, Nathan. Now hold that just like this. All right, so what am I trying to exemplify? Let's pretend Keenan, he is holding the earth, okay? He is like Tony Atlas here. We've got Jarrett holding the heavens. We think about our usual way that we process things theologically. We think about, oh, here's the earth, and then... Here's me, depending, I'm, gonna, I'm on the earth right now, and according to what I do or believe or follow or how I behave, will determine because there's two ways to go. I can either go up and be evacuated to heaven, that's what I want to do, or I may miss it and I might end up here in hell, separated from God. This is not the Bible story. What is wrong with this? Let's talk about this. So we're going to bring these guys in. So let's bring you over here, Keenan. okay? So, Nathan, you're going to step off the stage for a second. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
and they intersected, especially in the garden. And there was that intersection of heavens and earth. But then what came in was sin, and sin caused a schism and separated the heavens and the earth. But God is going to deal with this because what is his goal? His goal is to bring this back fully and reconcile fully. Give these guys a hand. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll talk a little more about this. But God wants to reconcile his good creation. He wants to bring it back in because the first track is me-centered. Oh, it depends on me, what I do. That's not the gospel. You respond to the gospel. And you know when heaven starts? Right now. Right here. You got a taste of it this morning. We get a taste of it every Sunday morning. We get a taste of it when we go to each other as a refuge, as a shelter. There's a taste of heaven. Re relationships that are righteous, that are set the right way. With God first, and then everything follows. And there's a reconciliation that God is seeking to do. Think about when that schism occurred and when heaven and earth had to separate, if you will. God could not just exist here because... Because of his goodness, he would destroy everything in his sight. He had to give himself a separate place. But there was always a hot spot. Where was the hot spot of God's presence? The temple. And before the temple? The garden, for sure. Between the temple and the garden? The tabernacle. The tabernacle. The reason I want to bring out that word is because what does John 1.14 say? Jesus did what? He dwelled among us, and the word is he tabernacled among us. He tabernacled among us, his presence. And what happened with Jesus' presence? Evil was just going every which way away from him. He was healing. He was casting out demons. He couldn't be infected, so to speak, by evil. He was displacing it, just like when God reconciles the heavens and the earth with the garden city coming down. Evil will be displaced and hell will be cast out of this city because God will protect his good creation. He will protect it. He won't subject it. It's about God responding to him. It's about the gospel. That's what the Bible tells us. Why is this important? It's important because what you believe determines kind of how you act toward yourself and toward each other. It's not a performance thing. But we can get in that mindset. That's why it's important to know, okay, this is how it works. I'm not on the performance treadmill. It's not like, whoops, just missed it. It's not how it works. It's relational. It's progressive. It's much more sophisticated. It be the beliefs that we have shape how we live. And we are to be like Christ because we get to have his spirit. So we are to be his hands and feet on the earth doing what he did. And he said, my kingdom is here. My kingdom is near we get to bring forth his presence. We'll look at the next slide. We're going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It should be up here. Amen. Thank you. It, it is God. Now it is God who establishes both us and you in Christ. He anointed us, placed his seal on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a pledge of what is to come. Next slide, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. We're living a different life, church. Way different from before. Because we have God's spirit to move in our hearts so we can live the right way, his way, and be empowered by his spirit to do so. Because Jesus became like us so we could become like him. And then the next slide, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, the Spirit of Christ within us, displacing what is on the earth, being God's, Jesus' hands and feet. But God's ultimate desire was to always walk with us, was it not? To be with us in the garden, to look at that sunset together. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to go back to the garden. Matthew 26. And we can go to the next slide too. Then Jesus 
went with his disciples. I'm sorry, in Matthew 26, we're going to look in verse 36. Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Here we encounter Jesus wrestling in the garden, struggling, the new Adam, the true son of God, but he would be victorious. Reflect on this. He would be hung on a cross, killed, three days in the tomb, hanging on that cross, placed into a deep sleep. His side would be pierced by the spear between the ribs, and out of him would flow his blood and the birth of the bride the church. It comes right back to the garden. It's a complete reconciliation. It's him going to the cross and then becoming for us the tree of life, the place of healing, of eternal life, church. The Bible is incredibly connected. It is God's word. The more I look at it, the more I'm convinced. There is no question. And it's powerful if you live your life by it. And that's our call. Live according to his word. He who hung on the tree is surely the one who died. He's the one that was cursed. He took the curse, and he did die. He found ultimate separation from his father, and he became the tree of life, the place of healing. He is the fruit imparting life. So church, to conclude, one final passage in Revelation chapter 21. We're going to look in Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21, verse 1, will end with a garden scene. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, no, mo- no longer any disorder, tumultuous. It's not that there won't be any sea, but as you dig deeper, the sea was a place of disorder and loss and death. That would be gone. Verse 2, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about those tears, too. If there's no more death, crying, or pain, <coughs> it has to be tears of joy. And he tenderly wipes them from us. In the end, church, there's two ways to live. My will be done, or thy will be done. Two ways to live. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, thy will be done. He lived a life that we couldn't live. He took the punishment that he didn't deserve and was cast from God's presence. <coughs> He proclaimed victory, however, over the powers of evil, sin, and death, and he opened the way for us to return to God, to once again be with him in the garden. A heavenly existence, church. Let us go away today with a biblical picture, the good creation of heaven and earth, with God's desire to dwell with us each and every day. We get to have that now, present reality, transformed life now. Let us go away with a biblical picture and reflect on God's love for us. Jesus came here as the embodiment of God's love, joining to the tragic human story, suffering our pain and the consequences of our sin. He conquered evil by allowing evil to conquer him, allowing it to exhaust its power completely on him, killing him. But his resurrection opens up an eternal hope for us. This is a story about a God who loves us and is committed to his good world, his creation to redeem it at all costs. For those listening today, I want to implore you, take Jesus as Lord. Seek the first. Seek first the good and righteous king. Let him take you home. Let him take you home to walk with him again in the garden for all eternity. Amen. Amen.